Previously on the all new adventures of the Doctor Who Book Club podcast. It's my pick. And yeah. I have no idea what you're going to pick. <laughs> no. So I decided I wanted to go for Nate Doctor. There's lots of them and we haven't done any. We've been on Earth a bit in the novels, so I wanted to go off world. We are going to be uh, experiencing Seeing Eye by Kate Orman and Jonathan Blum. Mm. Yeah, I have thought of doing something lighter. Then I thought, oh, but it's Kate Orman, and we've not done a Kate Orman yet. Let's go and, uh, and have a glimpse into the Seeing Eye. Excellent. And it's on Kindle. And now our story continues. Adventures of the Doctor Who Book Club podcast. This is Matt in Minnesota. Chris in South London. Happy January. Yes, we are now in 2018, a year that Doctor Who taught us um, was going to be ruled by a mad despot. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> it's good that that hasn't happened, isn't it? Yeah. <laughs> oh, 2018. Um, wow. Yeah. <laughs> I'm assuming you're referring to uh, Sally. Enemy of the world. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> Well, who also had a strange skin color that uh, didn't quite didn't quite match yeah yes. oh <laughs> since we've last met we have had uh all sorts of new things we've had mm. we've had new star wars we've had new doctor who yes what did you think of the christmas special i i thought it was brilliant yeah i i, I really enjoyed it and it was lovely because I, I was watching it with a mixture of regular watchers casual viewers and uh, open dissenters uh <laughs> to the presence of doctor who and uh, everybody appeared to like it uh which is nice i have a relative who often and just talks over Doctor Who and uh, they shut up. That's and um, yeah, and they were like, Well, this is actually quite good. So, well, yes, if you if you're quiet, then you might actually enjoy it. I really like the use of the 1914 setting and the mm. story about the Christmas uh, armistice for that one day. I heard that before, and I think Paul Cornell had written like a short story taking place, uh, a Doctor Who story taking place mm. during that same time, but I, I really liked it and uh. I think I liked it a little bit more on my second viewing and that the twist that there wasn't really a, a bad guy, so to speak. Mm. It felt more like a character piece. It reminded me of there's a big Finnish story called Circular Time, which has one of its segments sent entirely in the doctor's head while he's regenerating at the end of Caves of Androzani. Mm -hmm. And it um, reminded me a little bit of that, but I, I really liked it and I thought it was a good, um, a good send off for Capaldi and I really liked it. Yeah. That the direction from Rachel Talalay. I hope she comes back in some form in the mm. future. I don't know if she will or not, but um, I also really liked Mur Murray Gold put in all of his uh, musical touches. <laughs> we got lots of themes there. We did. We yeah. certainly did. Yeah, it, 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 it was just very good TV. I mean, it was brilliant that, um, that the the scenes um, with the 13th Doctor, even though directed by um, the same lady, had such a different feel. Mm. Um I mean, it was really did feel like the start of a new era. A new era without much dialogue, but a new era. I really liked the uh, slow reveal of Jodie Whittaker, too, and, and yeah. just how the Doctor looked at herself in the reflection first, and we saw mm -hmm. the Doctor through her own eyes. That was really cool. And yeah. All sorts of speculation about what the ending means, too, and whether or not uh, she could be separated from her TARDIS for part of the season, or mm. if it's just like a one-off, you know, sort of cliffhanger. Or time will tell. Yeah, I, I kind of hoped she is separated from her TARDIS for a while, because I, I also wonder whether or not the first episode we will sort of see her a ways after this and we sort of find out how she managed to escape mm. so uh, rather than starting mid-fall uh yeah I'll, I'll just repeat myself it, it was just a brilliant hour of tv you know and uh, 
Yeah, and though I must say it did slightly. I mean, I, I know that the, one of the reasons why the first Doctor was so, um, shall we say, old fashioned was possibly maybe to kind of address head on some of the stuff in the fandom. Mm. Uh, that's what I figured. Uh, whilst uh, yeah, Polly would occasionally be asked to put the kettle on, he never really treated her in the kind of like in the regular first Doctor stories in quite the same way. <laughs> so, yeah. And so the first Doctor is trying to treat people like that. So, but Dave Bradley's great. It was good. It was, it was really lovely. Well, I loved it. It was a great swan song for for moffat as well and i'm excited for the chibnall era and to see where where the doctor goes from here so yeah in the show yeah, yeah. all right so show and tell time mm. uh chris what do you have for us this month so um uh, i'm also going to be talking about something that happened over christmas uh so there's a tv series called mastermind which is a, uh, a quiz show and which uh, contestants choose a specialist subject um, a chap called Ben Holmes who uh, is doing a special subject of Doctor Who from 2005 onwards. Uh, you might ask as to kind of like why the 2005 point is because uh, I know because I've been through the mastermind audition process. Yeah. Uh, they are very picky on particularly on things like Doctor Who because Doctor Who's been done a few times that they say, oh no, you need to be very precise. Like they were trying to steer me through Doctor Who in the 80s um, uh, when I was uh, auditioning a few years ago. Um, so ben Holmes, oh, he was very good i had a chance to uh to watch the segment mm. before the show here and i was impressed uh i think i would have missed uh two of the questions that were asked yeah yeah i definitely wouldn't have got all of them um, yeah. i can tell you that i mean okay part of it is like you just research 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 and uh yeah so they, those were not easy questions yeah i would have missed the waterloo one i think and um the one about a town called mercy just because i wasn't placing which episode that was even though it's in the in the title (laughs) (laughs) Um, he has got through to the next round so he will have other special subjects we don't know what they are yet uh, because like when you audition you have to present a choice of four special subjects his general knowledge he was just as good on that and the question the general knowledge questions are just as hard as well Hopefully Mr. Holmes will go all the way. Even though I don't watch the show, I'm, I'm cheering for him. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so what's what's your show and tell, man? I think a previous show and tell I had mentioned I had gotten a 3D uh, TV, and that format is dying a very quick death over here. So in order to extend it a little bit, I went ahead and uh, gifted myself a multi-region Blu-ray player for Christmas. Ooh. Now I'm able to import titles like um, Valerian and Terminator 2 and Ratatouille, things that were never given a 3D disc release stateside but it also means that i can import several shows on blu-ray that um never made it out over here so like series two of space 1999 mm-hmm. the doctor who tv movie even though that's uh-huh. uh, yeah <laughs> <laughs> but it's, it's what you brought you into the show so i shouldn't yeah. go too uh, and it, uh, and it uh, has yeah. night of the doctor on the same disc so ah um, so at least there's a good doctor who story it's, it's the uh, yeah, <laughs> the complete paul mcgann collection yes. yeah yeah and then, um, but it also the new Shada, which uh, was delayed mm. over a year in the states. And incidentally, it turns out that Shada is region free, so listeners can import it now, anyways, even without a multi-region player. I'm halfway through watching it, and I have to say, I love it. The new score done by Mark Ayers with old-fashioned techniques is just incredible. It's right up there with Dudley Simpson's uh, City of Death score in terms of being memorable. And the uh, transitions between live action and animation are really well done. And we're, I think they're much better than the uh, the unofficial kind of fan animation that's been floating about. I haven't gotten to the newly filmed bits with Tom Baker yet, but I'm excited mm-hmm. to finish watching it. And I think with so many versions of Shada floating out there, I think this is the definitive one. And it's really yeah. the score that brings it all together. It's it's just so good. Yeah, I, I haven't watched it yet, but um, I've treated myself, inspired by the Christmas show, uh, to get uh, the Tenth Planet and Power of the Daleks. I've heard the Tenth Planet, but never seen it. Uh, and I haven't watched the animation Power of the Daleks yet. I am looking forward to that. That'll be a good double feature. Yeah, yeah. Well, also because you can intersperse it. Um, yeah, so maybe twenty minutes into uh, episode four, suddenly stop <laughs> and <laughs> put or, twice on a time. Oh, on. Yeah, or, or or triple feature in that case. Yeah. Yes. Wow. Yeah. Cool. So mm. the seeing eye. Yes. Jonathan Bloom and Kate Orman. Yeah. Yeah. So um, this is their their second novel together. 
they did Vampire Sites, uh, and uh, they've also done they done a bit of solo work beforehand. Uh, John Blum had done a story for the uh, um, short trips that we touched upon, the model train set, and uh, Kate Orman had um, written quite a few new adventures, uh, including Left Handed Hummingbird, uh, Sleepy, Set Piece, Return Living Dad, and Room with No Doors. Uh, I think that. Yeah, I can't remember where there's and, any others. Uh, so Violet in, I think, too. Oh, yes, of course. Yes. Because that being in on that one. Yes, because of computer problems. <laughs> <laughs> so they say, yes. Yes. Yeah, he may have just not written it, too. <laughs> <laughs> And I've heard uh, Fearmonger, which is one of uh, the early Big Finish plays, mm. speaking of parallels to elections, uh, written by Jonathan <laughs> Bloom. And uh, that was that was pretty good. And, of course, yeah. he did the, the fan video Time Rift. Mm. A long time ago, I was at a random gathering of the Minnesota Doctor Who Viewing Society. Uh, they showed a bit of an Australian quiz show that uh, Kate Orman appeared on mm. talking about Doctor Who, and that was several years ago when i wanted to say her appearance was sometime in the in the 90s but um she hasn't done a lot recently has she with the show i mean no. i don't know if she's retired from writing or if she yeah she hasn't done anything um with doctor who yeah i get, kind of get the impression that she has slightly i mean i wouldn't say retired i mean she's not that old but i mean she's i think she's kind of put her uh, keyboard to one side which is a shame because I think I mean they have written at least one of Jonathan Blum and Kate Orman have written prisoner novels. Uh, they have done a few other spin-offy things of uh, of various properties. I wonder how they divide up the writing duties as well because mm. most of this felt very Kate Orman to me, and maybe not as much. Yes, yeah. Who, who knows? I mean, it, it certainly feels quite Kate Orman, particularly does the uh, shall we say the Doctor plot has um, bears some of her hallmarks. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> so fans of the doctor being tortured you're in for a treat and this is a so this is an eighth doctor and sam novel yep. and it's still yep. early days in the eighth doctor's run mm -hmm. um published in june of 98 just as i was graduating high school <laughs> um, those are the days um yeah. this is the fourth and final book in an arc involving the doctor and sam splitting up and going their separate ways and it also um continues the dark sam arc which was uh, yeah. first mentioned in Alien Bodies and mm -hmm. is further explained in An Unnatural History. And yeah. um, there's lots of references to Dreamstone Moon, which is the previous book in the series by um, Paul Leonard, where the Sam and the Doctor are separated, but they, they see each other from a distance. And that yeah. follows on from, I think, Longest Day and Legacy of the Daleks, which they kind of each have their separate adventures there. And I don't think Sam is in Legacy of the Daleks at all. No, no. Um, and there's also mercifully few references to it as well. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so, yeah, I, th I think the Doctor alludes to have, um, the person that he meets in Legacy of the Daleks, um, uh, apart from that. No, mercifully, you do not need to read a John Peel novel to understand this book. You also don't need to have read Dreamstone Moon. I mean, I haven't read you, so I mean, it didn't prove me. It's worth saying Dreamstone Moon is available free on if you're a kind of like an Amazon Prime person. Should you fancy it, it is available on them, their Kindle, if you're an Amazon Prime customer. Well, a couple of other quick things before we get into the, mm. to the book itself. We didn't mention last month, but Lawrence Miles titled one of his chapters obligatory chapter named after a pop song <laughs> yes and uh and this month the first chapter is called ordinary world and mm. i wonder if that was uh deliberate where uh maybe i'm gonna start looking for that in every book we read to see if there's a, <laughs> at least one chapter named after a pop song yeah yeah, well, well, didn't we have a book where every chapter is named after a Duran Duran song or album? Oh yeah, that was a uh... Gary Russell. Yep, yep. Yeah. All right. So shall we uh, begin? So as we were saying, the Doctor and Sam split up. Uh, so in Dreamstone Moon, sort of Sam sees a glimpse of the Doctor. Um, so she knows that he's alive. Unfortunately, she's not been able to kind of um, to actually reunite with him, and so she's ended up homeless on this colony world um, called Halam and one thing's worth saying this world has a lot of kind of names that are sort of Hebrew or Arabic uh, and so it, it kind of gives a a nice feel to it as it's um, it's it's interesting uh, as, as, as be kind of reading a book where it's not all kind of British 
or kind of or like really fake alien names. It's also cool that Sam is a uh, is a minority in in this mm. sort of situation too. So you get a little bit of that through through her eyes, which is which again, like you said, it's it's interesting and it it is demographically, you know, the, where the future is heading. And it's it's one mm. of several points in this book where I feel like Kate and John really uh, are on point with. With their, with their depiction of the future it feels like this feels like a very real possible future to me yeah definitely um though it would be kind of nice if you didn't have a planet that was entirely populated by um by people of certain ethnicity it would be, it'd be nice if it was a bit more diverse because it seems like everybody has hebrew or arabic name but also though it's 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 nice as well that um speaking as we do uh in in, in this time it, it's nice to see sort of depictions of uh, of kind of Jew, jewish and sort of uh, arabic and in one of case a few cases explicitly muslim cultures all intermingling well and nicely mm-hmm. and with various an embassy being built um <laughs> <laughs> topical reference next so sam's homeless on this uh, this colony world and she's unable to um get a job or home because she doesn't have an id card and she's unable to get an id card because she doesn't have a job or a home she's basically in a bit of a kind of a, a pit of despair about this which is um where our reading for this month comes in hmm. She woke up with a start in the middle of the night, flailing around, ready to belt anyone who was hassling her. But the others were just snoring. She was just a scrawny kid with no money and no drugs, and no one wanted to get themselves thrown out anyway. She rolled onto her side and stared out at the basement. First step, find somewhere to sleep. Second step, second step, come up with any kind of idea what the second step was. What would the doc sod that? What would Sam Jones do? She had a horrible suspicion that the answer to that was curl up in a ball until it all goes away. But that wasn't the Sam she wanted to hear answer the question. She wanted space heroine Sam Jones, who stared down the monsters, who was sharp and resourceful and always, always cool, who had her own series and a range of posable action figures. Or at least Sam, the somewhat experienced galactic traveller, able to muddle through new or nasty situations with a minimal number of bounds. Done it before, should be able to do it now. Maybe he would rescue her. The doctor could turn up tomorrow or six months from now. They had cut his face. His skin was cold as ice. He was not moving. There was silence. She screwed her eyes shut and tightened her whole body up, trying to squeeze the memory to powder in her brain. No, he wasn't coming for her. Thank God. He was never going to know what had happened blowing into his mouth, pushing on his chest, blowing warm air into his cold mouth, pinching his nose, watching for his chest to rise, blowing, desperate blowing, wake up, lips press hard against his sandalwood blood, frost, ozone, sweet pressing and pressing, wake up, goodbye kiss. He hadn't died, despite her, he would go on. She would just have to accept the new situation, adapt to it, deal with it. She couldn't be the first one who'd had to build a new life after being with the Doctor. Hell, she'd already met a bunch of his ex-friends who had gone on fighting for what they believed in. No reason she couldn't do it too. She could make herself cope. If she had to damn well change every last thing about herself, she'd do it. And by the end of it, she'd have a nice, real job and a real place to live and a real her. That was our reading. Our reading this month was uh, given to us by uh, by my partner Lauren. Thank you, Lauren, for reading that. And uh, she has a similar accent to Kate Allman. <laughs> yes. So uh, so yeah, try 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 and imagine all of this in in, in in an Aussie accent. Different bit of Australia, I think. That's anyway. Not all Australians sound the same. <laughs> no, this is true. This is true. So Sam uh, is she finds herself in a kind of like a soup kitchen. And uh, she's kind of living there for um, for the best part of a month because she doesn't have the skills to get a job uh, in this kind of period. And eventually uh, she kind of learns how to kind of type and is offered an entry level position with INC, which is a company that kind of uh, is basically running uh, this world. INC comes from the noble pedigree of uh, of science fiction things that are not IBM, but are very close to. Uh, so thinking of how 
in particular. Mm -hmm. Um, Quite a few of the Doctor Who writers at this time worked for IBM. Uh, So uh, I I think that this is probably a kind of, might have been a little bit of reference to that. So including Justin Richards, who who, who was a little bit of a big noise at the time in in the Doctor Who world. There were uh, quite a few evil corporations, I think, throughout the Doctor Who books and, and in the show as well. I mean, you've got like, you know, the different mining corporations and then mm-hmm. wasn't the Butler Institute kind of became a big deal. And yes, yeah, yeah. And most of them get reference in here because mm. the Butler Institute merges with a company that gets referenced in this. But uh, yeah, back with INC, Sam realizes that uh, INC only hires kind of blanks. So these people have IDs for kind of like menial clerking positions. And if she stays at INC, she's going to be stuck in a soul-destroying job for at least 10 years uh, with no way out. Sam's uh, roommate, um, Shoshana, uh, insists that this really is all there is to life, which is a little bit depressing. Uh, you also get Sam as well trying to... She is wanting to change things, and she's finding it hard to kind of... to work with these kind of confines. And it was something that kind of like really came home to me, because, like, I mean, I've, I, I like to do things that are not just pure nine to five. There are times with recent elections in the UK where I've tried to kind of help out and I'm just like, I am just too tired. Uh, and it's 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 difficult. Mm-hmm. But spoke to me in possibly more in a way than it should have. So uh, Shoshana has also had her eye replaced with a computer implant. So she's going to be able to access the um, planet's uh, Xnet, which is kind of like a thing that is basically their web, and get a promotion. There's a couple of ways to access this net. So Sam uses like a version of Google Glass where it's like yeah. a headset that overlays with your eye but then they also have the option of selling their eye so they literally lose them lose an eye they get some money back for the organ donation and then they're expected to put this implant in so she can um, you know access things quicker and get promoted more quickly too yeah. it's just uh yeah really uh, you know organ donate forced organ donation is part of your uh career path it's it's kind of scary <laughs> yeah yeah yeah, it is. Yeah, so Sam, Sam, Sam and Shoshana basically aren't getting on, and so Sam walks out on her and uh, and her job, and uh, she decides to kind of go back to the shelter with just enough money to keep her going until she can find something more fulfilling. And while well, Sam is establishing herself on this colony world, uh, Ha Olam. Uh, the, mm. the doctor is still searching for her as well, and there's this really fun chapter where he's jumping through hoop after hoop of these different bureaucracies where he's trying to track her down anywhere. And he um, creates these computer programs that go out and attack all the different uh, mainframes that are out there trying to get hits on Sam. And he finally narrows it down to, okay, so he saw her on Dreamstone Moon and then she went to this other place and then she, she ended up on this on this colony world. And so he sets off, you know, sets the TARDIS for Ha Olam, the colony world, and he keeps getting kind of roadblocked by these different receptionists. And they're insisting that he communicate with them via registered electronic mail. <laughs> and there's a series of exchanges where everyone's like, oh, I must communicate with you by electronic mail. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> It's like, oh hello to the 90s yeah. <laughs> registering yeah or uh ftping images yeah there's some yes. of those references too yeah 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 because he says it takes 10 minutes to uh, ftp uh, a jpeg oh. Like, oh yeah i remember that <laughs> <laughs> those were the days yes. he um adopts an alias of uh james alistair bowman which mm. is partially i think a reference to uh, the brigadier and also uh, James Bowman, who's the he was the scientist in the TV movie that uh, was working on the atomic clock that he uh, swiped his badge, so I think it's a a reference to that. Mm. But he's forged these credentials, and uh, he finds out that all of these doors that have retina scans or uh, computer access points uh, all open automatically for him, and he realizes it it's because he's a Gallifreyan, and the retina scanning technology has been uh, keyed into his um, to to Gallifreyan biosignatures, so he's um, unleashing all sorts of chaos on the mainframe as a distraction while he's investigating, and he you know just in that kind of classic Doctor Who fashion barely misses Sam, you know Sam quits and he finds out that uh, 
this this iTech comes from the R and D division of INC out in Samson Plains. But before he can disconnect from the mainframe, a uh, security program knocks him out by delivering a shock to the uh, interface he's wearing. Uh, IBM, by the way, has an R and D division at White Plains. Oh, so there, there's that. <laughs> huh. Yes, yeah. The doctor uh, wakes up in the Oliver Bainbridge Functional Stabilization Center. Uh, and uh, the Bainbridge Center is something that's appeared in oh, I can't remember what else. It, yeah, it's something that does it will reappear in in Doctor Who. I think it's part of Andrew Cartmel's war stuff. Um, but anyway, it's a, a private INC prison, uh, and he's accused of corporate espionage. He's facing this mandatory ten year sentence. Not all the prisoners there uh, are kind of corporate spies. Um, uh, like some of them are, um, are kind of like retirees who know too much, and some, and this I found really tragic, are um, um, people who've had company health policies, and uh, they've got these artificial internal organs, but INC doesn't want them falling into the hands of their competitors, and so the easiest thing for them to do from a corporate point of view is to just imprison them. So these are people that are there just because of their failing health. It's horrific. And it also doesn't feel too implausible either in the current climate. Yeah. So all the prisoners seem resigned to their situation, except the doctor, who thinks he's in a Doctor Who novel, uh, and who immediately tries to escape. And then he fails because um, there's a security guard called Rifat who is waiting for him at the exit. Yeah, and he tries to um, escape a number of different ways, and he keeps getting foiled by that that same security guard who's always seems to be waiting for him. Uh, uh, like if if the doctor's gonna you know steal a helicopter or an or an as they're as they're called in the book <laughs> uh, on the yeah. roof, you know the security guard's always one step ahead of him and and waiting for him. Doctor Akalu, who's the the prison's moral facilitator <laughs> he's an interesting character he's he's kind of not so much a warden as he is the the prison psychologist or the person who is um trying to find out more about the doctor he reminded me a lot of like number two in the prisoner yes where yes. he's uh he's tr- almost killing the doctor with kindness throughout all the escape attempts he's he's not um the doctor's not really punished for this you know he, he may have some belongings taken away occasionally including a bear that he bought for Sam that he keeps wanting, you know, to give her when he when he sees like a stuffed teddy bear when he hopes to reunite with Sam. But um the doctor's been sentenced for ten years and, and I, Dr. Akalu is, is saying, uh, you can keep trying but you're you're not gonna be able to escape and it's just a very um almost setting setting things up for like a psychological game between these two where they're moving chess pieces on a board metaphorically as as mm-hmm. they're uh trying to figure each other out and one night when the doctor's in a cell he sees uh, an alien creature who has got multiple limbs and has got like blue crystal shards sticking out of it and it's kind of an insectoid like i was i was getting um that sort of vibe and it had compound eyes i i was kind of picturing like a worm almost mm. um i don't know how you were visualizing yeah uh, yeah these creatures but um, the doctor isn't sure if he's slowly going mad, and it was like a uh, like a dream, or he you know he's fairly certain that that this creature was was in his cell, but nobody believes him when he tries to talk about it. And months pass as uh, he tries various different attempts um, to escape, and he uh, befriends a, a prisoner, um, a lady called Zeba, uh, and uh, and she tries to kind of get him to climb over the wall with her. Um, but as they're doing that, uh, she unexpectedly lets go of the rope and just falls to her death, uh, which which was a, a shock mm-hmm. <laughs> when I was reading it. And uh, the doctor also realises that uh, every prisoner has had an implant in their eyes and so that the wardens um, kind of will know in advance every move that they're making. And uh, also um, they can kind of um, sort of just basically just turn him off if he just gets too far they discover that from uh the the doctor crying like a blood red tear and Mm. and seeing uh zeba she when he found her body like one of her eyes was like dripping the these red tears and and that's kind of the tell as as to whether or not they have like these this false contact lens overlay in their eyes which they can't remove it's it's not like a 
full-on implant where their entire eye is taken out, mm -hmm. which is what some of the the workers get. But this is just like a like a subtle contact lens that for for the first part of the novel the doctor didn't even know uh, was there. And also, round about this point, um, Rifat's uh, the um, the prison guard finally snaps and uh, basically nearly beats the doctor to death. And then, uh, slightly surprisingly, uh, Rifat is then placed under arrest and he's sent off to kind of like maximum security, which is quite, you know, which wasn't necessarily what I was expecting. Um, but I mean, it's because Dr. Okalu likes to kind of run a kind of like a dignified ship. I mean, as dignified as it can be with all these eye implants and everything. Yeah, the doctor eventually breaks into um, Dr. Okalu's office uh, um, where he finds the um, computer terminals being left on um, with no password or anything. And then there's an AI program there called Doctor, uh, all in capital letters. Uh, and uh, he finally realizes that this uh, Doctor uh, has been kind of like compiled to kind of like a near copy of him. Just basically from all the information they've been gathering over all the various um, escape attempts. So like a good AI, the more that it learns about him, the better it gets at kind of predicting what he's going to do. And uh, so it's now that the Doctor realises he can't get out of this one. He can't escape. Yeah, and like you said, Doctor's in all, all caps, like the, uh, the program Sleepy that was in the last month's novel that was referenced. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And um, the other, uh, and this this came up after Blink aired too. But I wonder, you know, could the Doctor have escaped if he just closed one eye? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I guess. But uh, I think the they mentioned too that the implants able to read some of his thoughts, but just mm -hmm. his uh, kind of his surface level thoughts. So while well, the Doctor's been in prison for these many months, Sam has been busy on her own. So she, you know, has no idea that the Doctor's on the same planet as she is, and that he's been looking for her um she left her roommate and quit her job at inc and she joined up with a uh non-profit charity group called living space which uh, brought her out to a desert community uh founded by former eurogen workers which is a uh, competing company with um inc on the planet and the eurogen workers were stranded there when their project collapsed due to a lack of funding and Eurogen refuses to release them from their contracts. So they're all um, like specialist scientists living in this village, and uh, their contract is built on one of production, so they're not producing anything, so they're not getting paid, but they're not able to be released from their contract either, so they're kind of stuck in this limbo. And then a large portion of time passes, and Sam is working at this village for over a year mm. while the doctor's imprisoned during that time. And she's constructing new homes and community buildings and helping build out this uh, this desert community. But it all kind of falls apart because INC decides to buy out uh, Eurogen's uh, hold on the land and, and they pay off the workers. So the workers who had been living there, they're free, but the trade-off is that... Uh, they lose their homes. You know, they're they're all forced to migrate and and go off. And for those that want to stay, uh, Sam tries to organize a protest where there um, there's like this sonic tank that's getting ready to to level the um, village. And Sam lays down in front of it, and others join in. And I was picturing a <laughs> it. I mean, it, w it wasn't a funny thing, but it was uh, like a more serious version of the opening to uh, Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> where they're yeah. all laying in front of the the bulldozer. Mm. So they're they're not able to save the village. So she heads back to the city with the people she's been living with for the past year, and they're intent on um, exposing INC's uh, corporate policies and decision making and um, shedding some light on it and, and getting media to start covering it. Well, it's worth highlighting that the um, these Eurogen scenes, those take place over the course of two years. So which is kind of like how long this is a book set over quite a chunk of time is um, Sam is uh, I think she's nearly she's kind of about 17 or so when this novel starts. Uh, and so she's now kind of like in her very late teens. She also has uh, as, uh, a series of relationships, uh, including um, one for woman. But the um, the book kind of it uh, it skirts around it, doesn't yeah, it? Yeah, it does. It does. It, it mentions so the the woman that she dates is named Chris, and yeah. Chris's gender is mentioned 
only once like earlier in the in, in the in the chapter and then later on it's referenced oh sam started dating chris there's no callback to that being mm-hmm. a same sexual relationship so i don't know if it was done that way subtly to i, I don't think they, these novels were being censored all that much or if it was or, or if it was just an attempt you know to make it unremarkable mm. hard to say i think it because because um, left-handed hummingbird had quite a run-in with the daily mail uh i think that uh, it might well have been also because i think the bbc were trying to make these books less controversial so uh, i i have a feeling that it might have been smuggled past the bbc hmm. that's my personal vibe well, I'm I'm glad it was. I mean, so she yeah. she, she joins. I think Chris Fay as the other uh, bisexual. Well, I suppose Benny too. Yeah, yeah. So, um, so Sam, um, Sam and her friends have been kind of organising protests, and uh, so they eventually discovered that INC uh, owns a controlling share in TCC. It's all going to get a bit corporate, folks. And uh, this is the same company that's been kind of conducting um, various inhuman experiments upon the prisoners uh, on the. Uh, Hiraf, um, so which was I think the, that's the planet from Longest Day, isn't it? Mm-hmm. I think. Yeah. Possibly. Uh, as I say, I I have heard so many bad things about Longest Day. I've never read it. <laughs> so, yeah. The longest novel. Uh, yeah, I remember. I think it was um, Dave Owen was the Doctor Who magazine reviewer at the time when Longest Day came out, and he said that so he was on a uh, transatlantic flight and he had to read the novel and um, to kind of hit a deadline, and uh, it, it, he said it was torture. Um, <laughs> <laughs> so, so with praise like that, I decided not to spend my uh, my hard earned student money. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, so um, yeah, so they they expose um, TCC's experiments to the public, but uh, INCC's lawyers claim that INC just invested in the company and had no idea what they were really up to. Uh, that's so unlike the corporate world, isn't it? Uh, so <laughs> Sam has her friend uh, Rachel hack into the databases of prisons and hospitals across the planet um, because she's hoping to find evidence of other kind of like abusers uh of uh, employee rights and uh and eventually rachel downloads the manifest of the bainbridge facility and uh sam finally learns that the doctor has been trapped there for the last three years or at least james bowman so she manages to guess we do get a few coincidences coming up here yeah. <laughs> <to say. laughs> um, yes yeah we do but it it could be a small planet or uh maybe there's only there's only a couple of cities mentioned so maybe there isn't a whole yeah. lot of presence on the colony world but yeah there are quite a few happen to be in the right place at the right time sort of moments yeah. but so sam realizes that the doctor's on the planet and and she's been kind of throughout the book um flashing back to a sequence where she was trying to resuscitate the doctor and give him mouth to mouth and ended up kissing him and i think that was in i don't know if it was in dreamstone moon or or the longest day longest, I think it's longest day there's a stray cat that she's been kind of tending to for the last three years um that originally showed up in the in the homeless shelter which mm-hmm. she f- decides to follow and it takes her to the target yeah <laughs> <laughs> it's a magic cat it's uh, deus ex catena i was wondering if if the cat was like a projection of the tardis maybe that the that it was keeping her company and then it led her there i don't know that seems just as plausible as it you know just randomly happening it seems more plausible but it's just it's never stated if, yeah if, if that I mean, is because the doctor the picks up the cat at some point in the book and is kind of talking to it like he would the TARDIS. So I wasn't, yeah. wasn't sure, but um, Sam finds the TARDIS, which is in the city of Inkopolis, which is the largest city on the planet, which is pretty much a company town owned entirely by INC. And mm. she starts coming up with a plan to, to get the TARDIS to the doctor. And one of her former uh, boyfriends, Paul, uh, who is one of the group in living space. I think it was the, she dates three different people. The second one yeah. is, is uh, Chris. Chris. Yeah. yeah. But, but Paul is the first. And, um, and he's Northern. <laughs> they make much flair out of the fact that he's Northern. So. He's, he's Northern. <laughs> yes. Well, every planet has a North. I'm trying to remember how they get the TARDIS to the, the prison. If, cause they, I don't know if they pile, they don't, I don't think 
Sam can pilot it. No, no, yeah, Sam realizes she can't pilot it. They try to find some kind of route through some tunnels, um, kind of going underwater, and somebody just happens to find a yellow submarine. <laughs> yes, the mini sub. That's right. <laughs> yes, yes, and it's, it's vibrant yellow. So it's like, why have we got the Beatles reference in this? Why is there a yellow submarine just hanging around, and seemingly with a key or various other things, so you can just pilot it? What's going on? Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, that was uh <laughs> Bizarre. Was something else. And they, they enter the uh prison through the duck pond. Going yeah. up through the uh yeah, there's a duck pond in this for those eleventh hour <laughs> conspiracy theorists. <laughs> How far back does it go? <laughs> yeah. Oh, oh. So the doctor is kind of in a nearly catatonic state and mm. while all this is happening and Sam and her cohorts from Living Space, they set fire to the library as a distraction and he uses Sam's cell phone to tell Paul how to pilot the TARDIS to him. Paul was waiting in the TARDIS waiting for the this call. So apparently the doctor's able to tell him which buttons to press and, and that's how yeah. the TARDIS makes its way into the prison. And the AI program, the doctor program, uh, really realizes what's happening but it's too late because it was kind of a flip of the coin situation where the computer program thought the doctor would have taken one of two paths the doctor picks one with his coin flip and the computer picks the other one and they mm. miss each other because a computer can't be in two places at once well it can but yeah, exactly <laughs> <laughs> it can yeah. so it should have stopped yeah. it yeah yeah it's worth saying that the reunion is actually rather interestingly low-key it's not this kind of great joyous moment because i mean the doctor really has been just broken by this uh, this experience because because he's had nothing to think about apart from being in prison and wanting to get out that he can't because like sam says that she would have expected some kind of like quick wit or something but no he, he's just been worn down which i thought was it felt like a very true touch mm. so you know in amongst all these yellow submarines um <laughs> so tardis um kind of uh removes uh, the doctor's uh, eye implant and uh yeah and so sam's just kind of consoling him i you think know, basically he is just so devastated and so uh, the doctor decides to go to the r d department uh to investigate um the source of the company's technology and uh, sort of sam goes with him meanwhile uh dr akalu uh, uh contacts uh, shoshana sam's roommate from sort of ages back uh, to uh, kind of create a profile of Sam and Shoshana is only too happy to help because it'll kind of help further her career and uh, also because uh, like when Sam left basically Shoshana had to pay an extra month's rent and uh, she nearly ended up on the street herself which I thought that's quite an interesting touch yeah she's still very bitter about that but it's, it's yeah. it also seemed very realistic like I could see someone, especially if they're living paycheck to paycheck, just hanging on to that. And the way the this society is set up, it's so cutthroat and capitalist in that regard. And it's just, yeah, it's just really interesting commentary on on all of that and, and the questionable ethics and the morality choices that present themselves to just ordinary people that are caught up in in some of this and and what they decide to do. So yeah, not the best outcome, but uh, it's understandable given her circumstances, I guess. Yeah, I mean, I vividly remember at university having to kind of go around because like, um, uh, somebody moved out on a mate of mine uh, and uh, they reappeared at the uni having kind of left and sort of having to go around and say, look, you still owe my mate a grand. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah. Uh, and, and also, I mean, in, in this world of, I mean, I don't know whether the term zero hour contracts is something that's, uh, that's known to kind of like um, non-Brits, but it's, it's these contracts contracts that um, quite a lot of companies have nowadays with uh, with British employees where you know, they will not guarantee you any work but uh, if they do need you they will let you know at the start of the week or maybe even at the start of the day in some cases uh, and might even be whilst you're trying to travel to work and the expectation they'll have work for you and if they don't have to work then you won't get paid uh, and that doesn't feel too far off from uh, from the world of INC. Mm -hmm. uh, so uh, uh, in many ways, um, we've been predicting the future here a bit. There's also, on a slightly lighter note, there's lots of references to data tablets. All right, I just want to say, just just reach through the book to 
to uh, to to John and Kate. Just, just use some loose word data. Tablets. Tablets is what we all call them. But yes, you're you're bang on. <laughs> there, there's so many uh, puns on the word "i" in this. You know. Oh, and the worst is yet to come. You could call them i tabs or i tablets or iPads. Yeah. 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 Well, I mean, there's, there's cell phones. There's no iPhones. But uh, yeah. anyway, so uh, Kalu and Shoshana. Before my digression, um, so I go to uh, Samson Plains to wait for the doctor because that's where Doctor has predicted that he'll end up, and uh, Doctor itself is becoming more and more Doctor-like as uh, as the book continues. And the doctor and Sam go to the the R and D facility out in uh, Samson Plains, and they've discovered that it was built over the ruins of a crashed alien spaceship. So the ship contains artifacts from different civilizations, including, and this is the big reveal <laughs> as to what is powering their uh, their internet, there is the uh, mind probe from Gallifrey. No, not the mind probe. <laughs> that was a spot on line reading. <laughs> it's difficult to achieve, but you got it. <laughs> oh, yes. So oh, the mind probe makes an appearance. <laughs> And uh, the INC scientists are using it, apparently it has 12 or 13 settings, and they're using it on level one to power uh, Ixnet. And the doctor AI program leads um, the prison psychologist and Shoshana to the doctor and Sam. And Dr. Akalu and Shoshana are saying that, you know, the doctor's conspiracy theories here are simple paranoia, and INC is a huge committee which isn't organized enough to run a secret conspiracy (laughs) to be doing all this. You know, they're completely uh, ignoring the evidence in front of them. Though that said, I've worked for a few large corporations. And yeah. like, yeah. <laughs> there are times where you're like, yeah, no, this is a, it's just incompetence. Is, that mm-hmm. there's a, is it round about here that, um, that the doctor comes out of the line of don't suspect uh, conspiracy when incompetence is the most likely explanation? Yeah, that's true. The doctor kind of realizes that there is a conspiracy, but it's probably not INC and that it's it's something else. And he's, you know, right on cue, an alien spacecraft arrives and it extends these poles, which are almost like uh, fireman poles. And uh, they come sliding down, the aliens come sliding down the poles. And sure enough, they're the uh, crystal insectoid creatures that he encountered uh, earlier and they begin harvesting technology from the the R and D center. And so um, these aliens say they've, they've got like a group intelligence, and they're referred to as the I, as in the letter I. So they capture Shoshana. Uh, they use her eye implant to uh, access uh, Xnet. There's also I think there's round about here that um, the book starts talking about um, the ship, their spacecraft, and using the term the eyeliner. It's like don't, don't do that. <laughs> <laughs> the don't. eyeliner. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> and so um, the doctor learns that the crashed spaceship, the one that the um, that the R and D center has been built on top of, is in fact the uh, chrysalis of a space dwelling creature that's been arrested at this stage of development by the eye. And uh, said creature is willing to help them if they can help it in return. This brings back memories of a certain Peter Capaldi story involving the moon. <laughs> uh, so Doctor escapes um, whilst um, the eye are kind of like tampering with the mind probe. The eye are kind of using the stolen eyes of a um, of, of a kidnapped time lord called Savar or Savar, uh, who um, uh, is a major player in the Infinity Doctors. And I think was first mentioned in way back in the invasion of time yes yes i think you're right yes huh. uh, and uh, his uh, his eyes are trying to regenerate uh which is sort of quite terrific but yeah every um, single person uh connected to the xnet is also now being melded into a new kind of entity which calls itself the ubernet and begins fighting the eye. So you have you have all of the eye tech versus Uber. <laughs> <laughs> oh, this is so prescient in so many ways. <laughs> yeah, some of them not intended. Yeah. But, uh, yes. Oh, so the uh, the eye <laughs> are this combined entity, um, not unlike a collective, and they're not able to come to a consensus 
about anything long enough to develop their own original ideas. So they simply steal technology um, when it's ripe. So they'll they'll plant like the mine probe on this planet, and they'll they'll let the colonists figure out how to use it, and then they'll come back later and reap the reward, so to speak, of the other's ingenuity. So that's kind of their their game plan. The eye head for uh, the Bainbridge uh, prison facility to start harvesting the eyes of every prisoner and guard with implants, but then the uh, Ubernet is able to communicate through Shoshana, uh, Sam's ex-roommate, and offers to surrender the doctor if the eye agreed to leave the Ubernet alone. And the, uh, the doctor AI uh, helps Sam uh, to connect to the Ubernet to shut it down, so she goes in with one of the older um, uh, kind of eye interface pieces where she it's just an overlay and she's able to uh destroy the mind probe while this is going on the doctors managed to evade the eye so these aliens long enough to upload his doctor ai into the control mechanism on the ship and the ai shuts down all the interference from the eye and so you have the ai the eye yeah um which allows the um the entity who's in this kind of cocoon to to finish going through its chrysalis process and the creature finally hatches and flies off into space and the destruction of the the ship that shell breaks the eyes um, artificial uh, collective and it reduces individual eye aliens to kind of mindless drone states so they're kind of standing around not able to do anything at that point so it's uh it was kind of like a two competing ai intelligences that reminded me a bit of the uh was it in uh the avengers age of ultron where you had vision versus uh the the big ai in that movie yeah i think you're right uh, I, I have tried to blank that movie from my mind it's <laughs> for my money it's not one of the more successful marvel films but mm-hmm. yeah 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 i mean often when you have two artificial intelligences going at each other uh in in, in any media i just go oh okay wake me up when this is over so uh shoshana um she's just wanting to kind of get back to her ordinary life because i know that things are pretty much settled and uh whilst um uh, akalu um he's kind of like goes into shock uh, after the current collapse of the Ubernet, because because uh, like his he only really wants to understand other people, just help them to get better. Like oh poor lamb. The um, the doctor wants to download the doctor AI into the Tyler's databanks, uh, so, uh, but the AI just um, just kind of runs off and uh, goes off to explore the universe with Florence, which is an AI from uh, Ben Aronovich's novel Transit hmm. uh, that was created by the Doctor in Transit and uh, also, I think, pops up in Sleepy and I think got reference in passing in Christmas on a Rational Planet. I think you're right, yeah. Yeah, so uh, so you've got, um, you've got two AIs going off together fighting crime. Sam has um, uh, has managed to use her time the Ubernet to rewrite INC's kind of like company policy manuals to make them kind of friendlier and nice, uh, and uh, yeah, sort of a, a lot more humane. And she now decides that traveling with a doctor will kind of give her a better chance to just kind of you know to carry on being an activist, basically. So she's kind of come to terms with. Um, her teenage crush on him because she kind of gives him a kiss and uh, she realizes that it's um, that it's not that exciting and she also knows as well that she can survive uh, on on her own terms and uh, also she's continuing it's one thing we've not we talked about this at the start of the book or at the start of our descriptions but um, like throughout this we have been having these kind of not so much flashbacks but these glimpses of this other Sam kind of like a dark haired Sam who's kind of living in a um in a bedsit in uh, King's Cross in London, which is um a, an area that's kind of like historically um uh, frequented by sort of prostitutes and it's used to be quite a rough part of town. It's uh, it's now um it's now where Google and the Guardian hang out, but so it, it's 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 got a lot better certainly since this novel was written. But yeah, so she's kind of wondering because she keeps on getting these glimpses of this alternative dark haired Sam that uh, maybe somebody might have tampered with her life hmm. in some shape or form to uh, make her a, a kind of an ordinary 
sort of almost perfect companion for the doctor and she feels that if this is a the case then um, they're in for a shock she's no longer this kind of perfect little companion and uh, that is where we end there's an author note at the end of this book where the uh, PMEB gets a thanks. That would be the uh, Paul McGann Estrogen Brigade. <laughs> and quick story, I had the uh, fortune of sitting near them. Uh, they were a wonderful group of ladies back at my first Gallifrey in 2004, which was back Gallifrey 15. That was Paul McGann's uh, first stateside convention appearance ever, and it was kind of a big deal. And I think that's where he met Susanna Harker from Ultraviolet, and they would later go on to date and I think they got married, and uh, they starred in Shada together, the Big Finish remake. Um, and it was also one of the last Gallifreys before they moved to their current hotel. The old conventions at the Van Nuys Airtel were really cool. There were only about 700 or so people attending, and this was, you know, very much in the waning era of the wilderness years. And you'd have, like, the book authors like Paul Cornell and Big Finish were really the rock stars of the convention because they were the ones producing the new Doctor Who output. I mean, these were the days where Sylvester McCoy would, you know, set up shop on a little table and he'd charge $2 per autograph per item. He would enforce a 10 item per person limit. <laughs> and uh, I remember um, seeing India Fisher and Clayton Hickman outside uh, chain smoking and being 23 at the time, I uh, pestered India into recording a voicemail for me <laughs> in character as Charlie Pollard. <laughs> and uh, I uh, I wish I still had it, but that was uh, several phone companies ago. Yeah. But uh, just the the era and the time mm. that this came out, I just have a real a lot of really fond memories of uh, coming in in the wilderness years. Paul McGann was kind of my doctor, and yeah, uh, yeah just I had all sorts of uh, memories and and kind of nostalgia just paging through this book, even though I had never read it before. But uh, it just really captured that era for me, I guess. Yeah. yeah. So. What you make it up? <laughs> <laughs> it felt like an episode of a TV series, almost like you know these are mm -hmm. the adventures of the Eighth Doctor and Sam, and they had these previously on sort of things and leading up yeah. to this adventure, and it kind of sets it sets it up for the next book or the next arc. And I don't know, I I felt very satisfied. I would say reading mm -hmm. this, it felt um, kind of along that same TV lines. It felt almost Whedon esque. Um, yeah, it felt like um, a little self-aware. You had the bit where Sam refers to herself as a, you know, she considers herself a space heroine who has her own series and possible line of action figures. Mm. Uh, that sort of tone and those descriptions, it felt very Buffy and of the era, like, you know, 1998 in a in a good way, in a like I yeah. mentioned earlier, in a nostalgic way. And I have to say the this was very readable, like the. John and Kate's writing style, at least for me, it was it felt very breezy reading this, like something you could pick up and, and read a large chunk of and it didn't sometimes um like Paul Paul Leonard, for example, it his work I've comes across to me as, as more dense where you have to really kind of pay attention to what he's trying to say and, and hear I don't know, I think effortless is a is a word I'd use to this, mm. to describe it. At least in terms of readability yeah I mean, certainly it's a very readable novel and also i mean i think past well one of the main things behind this book was trying to kind of uh, rebuild sam um to sort of make her a more interesting character sam was kind of sort of imposed upon the writers by an editor that was around i think 48 doctors and possibly vampire science and then left uh, and so this is them trying to kind of make somebody that you could actually write novels with mm. more about. Because Sam, certainly in her early books, I've never found a particularly interesting character. I mean, I think it's difficult to write a, a series of books in which one of the two central characters is a 16-year-old. Mm. Um, you can do it, you know, as um, I guess uh, Harry Potter and various other things have shown, but it, it, it's hard. It's hard to do that and make a, and make that accessible for kind of for I think an adult audience. So uh, it takes a real skill. Going down this kind of route is, is an obvious. Yeah, you know, it, it, well, it's a good way to go um, to just to kind of to age her, and because uh, you know she, she does feel changed. They did a similar thing with Ace in the New Adventures, where mm. they had her go off for for three years. They think they even ref the Doctor even references it in this. Yeah. He says, you know, three years, the same amount of time, you know, that Ace was away in the Dalek Wars, and 
yeah, I think aging up the character a bit helps because yeah, you're right. It's the issues and the the thoughts and the complexity you have when you're you're in your twenties versus your teens. You know, hopefully, yeah. yeah. I mean, hopefully, yeah, hopefully, yeah, yeah. It keeps building. Yeah, yeah. But uh, yeah, yeah, it's a good point. And also, it's good to see the character aging on the page because I think that's one of the problems we always had with Ace, um, with kind of you know um, soldier Ace, is that you don't see the growth until suddenly, like, oh, you know, here, here, here she is kind of um, going around being brutal and everything. Like, really? Oh, okay, this doesn't seem like the person that Sophie Aldrin used to play, whereas here it's kind of more gradual. Um, I mean, it does help that you have you know, very good writers doing this mm. as well. Uh, and, and also, I, mean, I think as I've kind of alluded to as well, I mean, uh, you know, I, I, I do like the kind of, like the, what should we say, undertone of corporate satire? uh overtone <laughs> maybe yeah it's it's uh yeah there's a lot of sun makers in here i think yes in that same yeah. sort of commentary yeah 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 i think so and it's it's set i don't think we mentioned this it's set in the 22nd century so mm. there's a reference to earth rebuilding after the invasion which is probably referencing the that, yeah the dalek invasion yeah. of earth so it's also it feels grounded within the doctor who universe too but it's yeah it does it feels new and fresh like we haven't seen this and and they they got so much of it right in terms of you know where technology is headed to so yeah it's un, it's uncanny isn't it mm-hmm. um just because like quite often you know i mean okay sure we we're having a little bit of fun earlier with all of the electronic mail but that kind of gets dropped fairly quickly it's almost as if they know yeah we'll we'll, <laughs> we'll get this bit out of it but we'll go we'll predict tablets we'll <laughs> <laughs> we'll go through various other things yeah, or the the eye interfaces yeah. and the yeah you know that's google glass 15 yeah. years before that was yeah. a thing and yeah there's even a reference to uh bestel allison bestel mm. who famously you know made the the bestel test yeah um i forgot that it went back that far but it, yeah i mean she was she's been active since the 80s but she even gets a nod um in one of the early chapters does this book pass the bestel test oh i th- for sure I, are you sure yeah with Shoshana and Sam talking Sam, about yeah. their, well, job, uh, yeah. their job and yeah, stuff, they, of course. That's yeah, true. That's yeah. true. That's true. That's true. Yeah. They don't talk. Yeah. Okay. Um, the best one test, in case you don't know, is um, two female characters having a conversation that doesn't involve a man. Um, yeah. And it's and it was people often forget too that it was originally meant as a joke, as a you know commentary on how absurd you know the bar that set is so so low, you know having mm-hmm. a conversation about anything that's not related to a man i mean it's it's a it's such a low bar that you'd expect 90 95 percent of movies to pass it but it, it it isn't at all yeah no we've just had our first star wars movie that passes it oh the last Jedi. yeah <laughs> yes wow. that, that's that's kind of appalling <laughs> yeah so, um, uh, so as I was saying, that, that's what someone has told me. I kind of, I do wonder whether Rogue One possibly has it. But anyway, one other quick comment is mm. the proper TARDIS key is in this book. <laughs> <laughs> I, I consider the uh, third Doctor, fourth Doctor, eighth Doctor key to be the proper one, and uh, yeah. none of this Yale key business. <laughs> no, no, it's the proper key. It's lovely that Sam is hanging on to that key as uh, as as kind of like a memento. And, and it's something that she it is precious to her. Yeah. So how uh, how are we going to mark this? You go first. You go first. I'm still wrestling. It may be surprising, <laughs> but um, I'm going to give this one a nine. Mm. I really enjoyed it. I just thought the the world building was great. The readability was fantastic. I loved all the bits with the Eighth Doctor. The scenes with him just saying off the page for me. I talked about it earlier, but it's just a really good reminder that McGann was my doctor and Kate and John are just spot on with the futuristics as part of the, the world building. And we feel 20 years closer to this, to this future, you know, for not in a good way, but um, <laughs> yeah. it just, uh, yeah, it just, of the books I've read, I really like this one. Some of the things that knocked it down a little bit for me, we, we touched on some of the coincidences, the yellow submarine, those sorts of things. But um, overall, yeah, I just, I really liked it. 
Yeah, I I really enjoyed it, but uh, I think for me, I mean, it loses something as soon as the I rock up. Um, like it just kind of becomes a Doctor Who novel because I was looking forward to seeing the Doctor and Sam overthrow kind of I and C mm. and sort of overthrow something that feels a bit like our time, and it does feel as if they kind of like lost their nerve. Mm. A little bit and say, so, Oh, here's an alien invasion. So, oh, oh, okay. Yeah, I, I was wanting to see somebody kind of make substantial changes in a world that felt like ours. What I'll do is I'll give it an eight. Uh, yeah, I, I just wish that it was less kind of like, Oh, here's some random aliens rocking up um, uh, 80% of the way through the book. That's a really good point. I don't think they, they needed that extra subplot. Like, they could have easily just have kept it inc discovering the mind probe themselves rather than yeah. it being dropped there by the eye or whatever it, it, yeah, it was a brilliant book um and and makes me want to read more from uh, of the eighth doctor and sam um and particularly this version yeah the sam that the book ends with not the sam that the book that begins <laughs> with yeah. um, not that she's a terrible character. it's just th- there doesn't feel anything to her particularly but it's just it's just fascinating to see her grow yeah this book went a long way in terms of her character development and yeah. putting it on the page and going from point a to point b the long way round over three years mm. um yeah excellent is there anything further you want to say about seeing i or should we should we, should we put it to bed if you were a fan of the aliens they they appear in the bbv audio play i scream <laughs> by a lance parkin oh i like lance parkin stuff but i i'm i'm kind of scared by that title that uh, the terrible eye puns are continuing yeah i really like this one and i thought it was a great uh if you're looking for a an eighth doctor novel to read you you, you could do far worse than this one that's for sure yeah because it is an actual novel um it really does feel like that yep all right so listener mail We got a question in on Radio Free Scarrow's advent calendar fluid links. <laughs> yes. This past well month. Done. So uh, day 11, asking them what their favorite fiction and nonfiction Doctor Who books were. So go download uh, that episode to hear their responses to that question. It was kind of fun. Yeah. We also got a letter from uh, Jeremy Bement from the Doctor Who Panel to Panel podcast. Okay. Uh, he had said he had really enjoyed our podcast on uh, focusing on prisoners of time mm-hmm. and wanted to hear our thoughts on the f- the 50th anniversary comic story. He provided some background on some of the other artists we missed. So oh, cool. There's a lot of them. So I'll, here we go. I'll try and try and make this brief. But um, yeah. So Simon Fraser worked on uh, the 2000 AD comic in the UK. Okay. After uh, Titan got the rights to create Doctor Who, he was chosen to illustrate the 11th Doctor series and has done so for oh. almost uh, three years now. So that's okay. pretty cool. Um, Gary Erkstein from Part 3 was a comic artist for over 20 years and has drawn everything from Captain America and Judge Dredd to Star Trek, Star Wars, and Doctor Who. Mm-hmm. Um, I really liked his pop art style. I think that was the uh, John Pertwee one. Um, Philip Bond, Part 4 probably best known for drawing Tank Girl and did some uh, Doctor Who issues for IDW before okay. uh, his work on Prisoners of Time. Uh, Kev Hopgood from Part 7 has been drawing comics since the mid-80s and did a lot of work for uh, British Marvel Comics. He's best known for creating the uh, War Machine armor while he was the illustrator oh, yeah. of Marvel's Iron Man comic, and he also drew several stories of the Seventh Doctor in DWM. Okay. And then Roger Langridge, uh, part eight, which I don't remember liking that <laughs> art style. <laughs> he uh, was a longtime independent comic creator, best known for his books, Fred the Clown and Snarked. He was also the creator of the critically acclaimed Muppet Show comic for Boom Studios. Oh, that is very good. Mm. That is that is a very good comic. Yeah, yes. and his, his art style definitely suits that style. Suits that more, yeah, I yeah. think. Yeah. He yeah. also has done uh, many of the one-shot stories for DWM and was the letterer uh, for the strip for many years. Okay. Interesting. Uh, we've got four more. Giorgio Bezito, uh, part nine, uh, used this issue to springboard her career when it comes to Doctor Who comics. When Titan Comics came in, she started as a fill-in artist, and she's currently drawing the 10th Doctor comic series. 
uh, Elena Casagranda, uh, part 10, got to draw the 10th Doctor in this story and then became the first penciler on Titan Comics' 10th Doctor monthly series three years ago. And then Matthew Dow Smith, part 11, was one of IDW Publishing's main Doctor Who artists when they were publishing the line. And he's also drawn a lot of X-Files comics in addition to creating his own comic series. And then finally, Kelly Yates, part 12, drew several Doctor Who comics for IDW and is currently creating Doctor Who artwork for Titan's uh, line of Doctor Who shirts, mugs, and other merchandise. So really cool to see so many uh, IDW artists carry over to uh, Titan. That's pretty cool. Yeah, Um, that is cool. Most of these folks have been interviewed by Jeremy on his podcast, so listeners can search iTunes for Doctor Who Panel to Panel or go to DoctorWhoComics.com for more info. So um, thank you, Jeremy, for writing in uh, all that information, and I, we appreciate it. Yeah, we definitely do. Chris, do you have anything from uh, the Facebook? Not had a lot of comments. I'm just having a... Uh, this is exciting stuff whilst, whilst, whilst I have a look now to see if we've we, yeah we haven't had anything kind of further since um uh, since Christmas on a rational planet but it uh, we, we, we've we've had likes and we always enjoy likes uh, we also had some very nice um uh, iTunes comments um that um because we also discovered something strange about how iTunes reviews work didn't we yeah uh, in this, um, I could see various iTunes reviews uh, from the UK, which you couldn't, yeah. and I couldn't see the ones from the US either. Uh, yeah. So, um, so listener Jeff um, wrote a lovely uh, iTunes review um, on the UK side. So, um, uh, um, thank you very much for your for your for your kind kind words, uh, and uh, and apologies for being so late in, in, in thanking you for them, because uh, we, but I must confess, I don't use iTunes anymore, I, I use Overcast, because uh, the um, cause the podcast uh, thing causes so much problems with my uh, iPhone, the actual kind of Apple podcast app, because uh, I find it kind of caches things uh, ad nauseum, I've got about a gig worth of cash, so you know what, I'm going to get rid of that, <laughs> use, uh, use another app instead, uh, but but no, thank you very much for your, for your, for your kind words, and and also for our our, our American uh, contributors as well. And uh, if you're if you've been saying sort of nice things on iTunes, and if you are not in the Americas or the UK, and you're saying, well, why are these these nasty people not thanking me? Um, it's because we can't see them because Apple is twisted. <laughs> yes, <laughs> they're all part of INC. <laughs> yeah, we just need a we need our eye eye interfaces to uh, leave the right reviews, I guess, in the right places. Yeah. 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 So next month. <laughs> yes, because I don't know what we're doing. So. <laughs> you don't. <laughs> no. I wanted to uh, read a Doctor that we haven't read yet, so I decided to go with a 10th Doctor novel, Yes, or a collection of novellas, really. Ooh, okay. We're going with the story of Martha. Oh, okay. We find out out what Martha was up to during her year on Earth fighting the Toclophane. Okay, uh, okay features uh the linking material is by dan abnett ah yeah so we've read his work in um the silent stars go by and of course he worked on guardians of the galaxy yes yes and uh it features stories by uh david roden uh stephen lockley and paul lewis right these are names that aren't ringing any bells rob shearman that name rings a bell yes (laughs) simon joet or jowett so the only one i recognize is rob shearman but um Yes. The uh, the audio for this one's a little interesting too, in that I think Freema Adjaman recorded the four stories individually, but didn't record the linking material. So uh... <laughs> <laughs> why would you do that? <laughs> yeah. Right. So uh, <laughs> you can you can find at least some of the audio yeah. available, but then also, and I think this one's on on Kindle as well. So okay, it's it's out there a few different ways. Yeah, most of the um, um, the, the kind of tempt up to stuff is. Um, interesting and um, that's set in my least favorite finale uh so <laughs> i'm wondering what i'm gonna make of this <laughs> well, oh yeah. dear and... so, oh, i'm sorry I, I was tearing my eyes and it was like oh the master is oh dear um, oh. i was so glad that john sin came back because <laughs> he had such potential but the problem is that he's he was in my eyes lumbered with two of the worst master stories in his tenant appearances hmm. um, yeah i'm glad he came back too 
Yeah, Utopia was very good, though. It was, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Well, 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 well this is unexpected. <laughs> <laughs> oh. oh, dear. Yeah. All right. Well, All right. Gosh. Well, on that note. <laughs> yeah, so I'm just going to reel over in shock and uh, maybe I'll, I'm training for, uh, shall we say, a small run later on this year. So I've been trying to kind of like have non, I'm having non-alcoholic beer. I might sip a little bit of alcohol then just to recover from the shock of... <laughs> <laughs> oh, no. oh, dear, dear. <laughs> At least it's not set in the end of time. It could be worse. <laughs> don't think it's actually set during the episode like the linking stuff maybe but i think the other stories are just you know stories that of martha and the doctor's previous adventures that she tells to like inspire oh is it Uh, oh okay oh Uh, good so yeah good good so it's not just adventures of her journey through the wasteland no 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 (laughs) oh good yeah because there's one good thing about about there's one thing i really remember about that episode is the um the dalek speaking in german Mm. Yeah, yeah, that, 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 that was good. Um, so I would rather read a book about the Dalek speaking in German <laughs> than half a journey all the way through the wasteland. But yeah, okay, okay. Well, this is this is good. This is good. Because one of the good things about this podcast is that it kind of sometimes kind of forces us to kind of read things that we possibly otherwise wouldn't have. Uh, and, uh, and and explore new concepts and, and hopefully I'll kind of come away with a renewed appreciation of Martha Jones. Yeah, and I I think Martha deserves a little bit more love compared to yeah. uh, Donna and, and Rose and Yeah, yeah. I mean she was she was kind of lumbered a bit with the whole kind of with the doctor still kind of getting over Rose. I was like, Oh come on, just get over it. Just 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 get over it and appreciate the fact that you she she had the potential of being an interesting companion. So uh uh, I, I I look forward to um, to kind of reading better. All right. Well, until next month, I've been Matt in Minnesota. Chris and Sam Holden. Happy reading. Thank you for listening to the all-new adventures of the Doctor Who Book Club podcast. Special thanks to George C. Music for use of their song, Doctor Who Theme, Swing Jazz Version. You can follow us on Twitter at ANDWBC Podcast and like us on Facebook. You can support the show by leaving us a rating and review on iTunes. You can contact the show by emailing your thoughts to ANDWBC Podcast at gmail.com. And until next month, happy reading. <laughs> oh wow sorry I, I didn't wish to sound negative i was just like whoa this wasn't what i was expecting <laughs> yeah it was uh <laughs> yes i'm just still in shock uh <laughs> previously on the all new adventures of the doctor who book club podcast could you get a better name than that Hi, this is Charlie Pollard, Edwardian adventurous. I'm sorry Matt can't come to the phone right now. He's busy fighting Daleks. So if you leave a message, he'll get back to you. Bye. Please leave your message after the...